Yeah. So, any news from anybody this week? Um, Goff, have you got no. anything you'd like to tell us? No, 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 nothing, nothing on a personal. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, what about you, Bill? Any any news from you this week? No, you asked me that an hour ago. <laughs> yeah, that was for a different group of numpties. Well, no. Um, and Henry, just tell us a little bit about the castle you went to, Warwick. Yeah. He's not going to say anything now because he's French and he doesn't want to talk to us. Go on, tell us a bit more. It was grey, it was big, and it had lots of stone. Oh. Did you see any ghosts? No, not on this occasion. All right, okay, fair enough. Um, right, thanks for that. Um, who else have we got? Oh, Anne, we've already had your news. We, how's your washing machine these days? Oh, uh, I went to Landark Hospital today. Oh, right, that's enough, Richard. <laughs> Anything you want to tell us? And I thought of your Roman stone. I thought of going to <laughs> Landark. Ah, right, you thought of going to the Urbit Cross yeah. at Landark And I Church. found right. out that there's a Catholic comprehensive school. Uh, I've been passing it every day. Every time I've gone to Dennis Powers, I've been passing it, and I didn't know. And there's a road called Turnpike Road, uh, running right through Dennis Powys. It's an alternative to the traffic lights. And do you want me to give you another fact? Pardon? Do you want me to give you another fact? Yeah. Elvis Presley died in August 1977. Richard, anything you want to say, Richard? Uh, no, I'm OK. Right, OK, right. I we're going to get straight to the. Well, I thought that was quite interesting. Right. We're going to get. There. Shut up. We're going to get straight to the proverbial underpants, right? Um, we've just been following the line and we've been looking at Arbor Law. Now we're going to be looking at the facts of the site of Arbor Law. Now, Arbor Law, A R B O R. Um, no, I, I, that, I've been spelling A B O R L O W. Right. Has anyone ever been to that site in Derbyshire? No. I think well, that Arbor is the way the Derbyshire people say it. Arbor Law? Arbor Law. Yeah, and. Arbor Law. Cool. Uh, by the sounds of it, nobody has ever, ever been there um, that, that I've spoken to in these classes. There, there was nine people on yesterday, which was great. <coughs> um, and obviously, you guys, there, there's six of us now. None of you have come across the site of Arbor Law. But the, the site of Arbor Law is. is in the top mm. um, best mm. Neolithic sites in Britain, and no, no, nobody's ever heard of it until about three weeks ago. I'd never heard I, of it I'd either. Heard of it. And sh um, the the one the one the one thing about the one thing about Arbor Law um, is that the, the one the one amazing thing about Arbor Law is, is that you know it came to me by complete accident and um, i may have mentioned this last week there was i did my youtube recording and somebody on youtube said we've got some cinematography about a site called arbor law up in derbyshire i looked i i you know it was one of those things i thought this isn't going to be an interesting site it's going to be boring it's just going to be a couple of stones in a field nothing special which would have been a wrong attitude of mine but you know what i'm trying to say they basically they basically said this is a major site, and I looked at the footage. It is a major site, massively important, and that's why I'm doing the lecture today. Just, just a, just a, um, just a couple of thank yous. Thank you, everybody, for um, for the monies this month. I won't be asking you for any monies until next week. No, I'm only joking for another two months. Um, and the other thing as well is obviously um, next week we continue this theme that I started in the YouTube video looking at how reconstructed sites in history um, are bad portrayals of what the Neolithic period was like. So that's what we're doing next week. And the following week, we're going to be looking at those Barrow people again. We, 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 last week, we looked at um, the antiquarian um, um, Barrow excavators. So next week, then we're going to be, be doing that as well. So let's, let's just get straight over to Arbor Law. Let's just try and understand Arbor Law a little bit better. Uh, and let's use the new technology so this is this is blow your mind technology this is interactive technology this is in fact
better technology than I had uh, with um, Goff in the goat shed. <laughs> Look at that. Isn't that great to, to see that there? Mm. It, it just, it's just all, all the bits of history, right? Mm. So Arbor Law itself, Arbor Law itself, it is, is a site for me that I needed to tell you about. Um, because what I usually do when I'm talking about archaeology and history, I take us down to Wiltshire, I take us down to Cornwall, I take us to look at bits of Wales, I take us to look at Orkney and some stuff in the middle um, and some of the Hebridean Islands. So what I've got to do is, is I've really got to expand um, on the sites that we actually look at. So, so that oh, why have we got Amber Heard in here? Oh, for, there you She's go. neighbours, isn't she? I, 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 I've met Am Amber Heard. No, Amber Heard's not in blooming neighbours. I don't know who, who that is, but she looks like the one in Neighbours. Anyway, that's oh, a lovely that's, that's picture. John, that's, that's Johnny Depp's ex-wife. Who? Johnny, Johnny Depp. Depp. Oh, <laughs> I thought it was someone interesting, like, off cross Anne, <laughs> Anne, Anne, shut up. Right, Arbor Lung. Now... We're, we're looking at some we're looking at some general um, images now and then we'll look at these spectacular images of the aerial photography now for the sake of argument some things that that, that we've we've already mentioned the, the, the stones themselves are carboniferous limestone and this is in the Peak district the Derbyshire Peak district it's it is a well-preserved Neolithic henge monument. Uh, with stones in the middle, a henge monument is a ditch, is a platform, a ditch, and a bank. Platform, ditch, and a bank. That's how you identify a henge monument. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a very unusual site. And the way I did this on Tuesday was introducing you to the site as people had never seen it. Obviously, this is, this is an article in the newspaper. It's the first time you've seen this. There are over 50 limestone blocks. Some of them may have been um, some of, as you can see, there, there's some broken bits of stone there. Um, some of the uh, some of the smaller bits would have been with bigger bits and so on. It's believed that there may have been around 41 standing stones or maybe they weren't standing stones, recumbent stones arranged in what's described as an egg shaped circle. And the stones themselves, these upright stones there, which are not upright, they're recumbent, they're lay, lying flat. Um, some of them themselves vary in size between 1.6 and nearly three meters in length. Now, one stone is partly, um, um, is partly sort of at an angle, right? Just one. Um, and that's why people have thought that these stones themselves were actually upright at one time. But that will come out whether that's fact or fiction as we actually go through this. Although that it is often stated the stones have never stood upright, it is possible that they had originally been set upright in shallow stone holes. Unfortunately, most of these don't show signs that there were any holes below them at all. Now, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do something. I'm going to go off this image for a few moments and I'm going to show you something, right? To try and explain what might be going on here. Again, this is a bit of a, an optical illusion to some of you because you really want to see more about the site. You really, really want to know where it is. So we've got all those, all those things coming up. So what I'd like to do now is I would like to come to the screen so I can scribble on the screen. Because Goff likes my scribbles on the screen. He, 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 he tells everybody about it. So, so here we go. And we do that. Now, if you think of, this is a general thing. This is what a henge monument basically looks like. So you've got a bank. You've got a flat bottom ditch. A platform. Another ditch. And a bank. 
that is, in fact, what a henge monument looks like. It doesn't necessarily need to have stones in it. Some henge monuments can range between 10 meters and nearly 500 meters in diameter. That's across. 500 meters in diameter, half a kilometer in diameter across. That, that's quite amazing. Now, if we think, if we think, just for, for example, right? Just for example, those, sta those stones may have been standing upright. So let's just change the color. Let's just sort of put one like that, okay? Now, what archaeologists are presuming, the ones that are laying flat like this, um, they're thinking, oh, there's no evidence for them lying uh, upright because they're, they're too shallow holes. But there's one thing that's been forgotten, something called erosion. <laughs> now, when we think, if we think about a monument today, right, and we go something like this, right, and it's only a slight henge, it's because what's happened is that the mate some material has ended up deposited in this bank. So that means that some soil has ended up from the platform into the ditch meaning it's quite possible that there may have been soil built up around these stones, but unfortunately it's been eroded into the ditch. That is one theory. But some argue that these stones were never ever upright. I'm just giving you some alternatives, some ideas. If we sort of rub this out here, uh, this is something I didn't sketch on Tuesday as well. Uh, in Cornwall, what they're finding is they're finding sort of semi-raised areas, right? And what they are then seeing is that they're, they're seeing the tops of stones sticking out. And it's because the stones were buried. And, you know, they, they didn't need to be put upright or, or they were just buried upright. You know, um, there's one thing what I'm trying to get across in history and archaeology, there's never one answer for everything. Um, and I believe that that numpty, um, um, uh, Catherine Roberts, uh, went, on, went on television today, uh, a few days ago, and she said, oh, um, she said, oh, um, you know, they were hunter-gatherers in the Mesolithic period, they lived in settlements. And you're thinking, we've done months of this, and does she really know what she's talking about? If people are settled, they're no, hunt, no longer hunter-gatherers. And what I'm trying to get at is there's different ways of looking at the past. Some of these stones may have been upright. Other stones weren't. And what we're going to do, we're going to tell you a little story that I've told all of you about half a dozen stones but it's, at times, but it's very, very relevant. I'll just, I'll just tell it quickly, right? University lecturer, right? There's a four-ton stone. And it's lying on the ground. And there's there's two lads. Okay. There's two lads standing alongside it, right? Um, and the university lecturer is taken out in the uh, morning. And there's a crowd of people around this stone. And the crowd of people are waiting for these two boys to move this stone slightly up a slope for one kilometer. And this archaeologist, Professor Colin Renfrew is looking at this thinking those two boys are not going to be able to move that stone anywhere. And what happens, He his eyes open up. Along the entire route, there's the oil and there's lots of broken bits of seaweed. In fact, it's a seaweed causeway one kilometre all the way through. It's slightly going uphill. Now, this is a guy, a professional archaeologist, a professor of archaeology, Manchester University, other universities, University of Highlands and Islands. He's shaken his head and said, said it can't be done because archaeologists have never been able to do this. Because they've not used seaweed and they've not used kelp. All they've done is tried to drag them. In fact, there was a TV programme recently where, it, it, where they had 15 archaeologists with a hole drilled through a stone, which was only slightly bigger than this. I think it was about eight tons. Um, and they were trying to um, drag the thing along loads of um, um, bits of timber and all the rest of it, and they couldn't do it. And Colin thought, right, these two boys ain't going to do it by themselves, right? They did. In fact, 
when they actually got halfway, when they got to here, one of the boys fell fell down. And um, for some strange reason, he must have been at the front or guiding it or something, right? His arm got trapped under the stone. So he had to be taken to hospital. He turned out to be okay afterwards. So the remaining boy managed to push, push the stone by himself up the top of the hill, right? So then what happened, I know I've told this story to you so many times, but there's a big point to this because it really links in with R below. Yeah. Um, when the stone got to here, Colin had followed with the group to here with the one boy, right? Um, and the boy was then, Colin turned his back um, because the boy was going off to the pub or going off to the local taverna. This is on Pacific Island. It's going to be a taverna, right? And he's thinking that every lots of other people are going to be there and are going to be putting the stone in a hole, right? So he's looking at the boy going off and, you know, waving at him and saying, oh, you know, thumbs up and all the rest of it. And as he turns around, there's no one there. The stone is just lying there, right? And, and he can't work out why the stone is just lying there. He's just thinking, oh, um, it, it's a... It's a four, it's a four ton boulder and it's just lying there. And he's, he's, he just feels that the two boys have failed. He feels that he feels that the whole thing's been a failure. When he goes into the taverna and, and he, and he, in the morning, he goes up to somebody and says, oh, I'm, I'm really disappointed that, um, that nothing was done with the stone and it went quiet. And one by one, they said, you Westerners, you think that achievement is by erecting the thing. The great achievement was moving the stone. And then Colin Richard knew it was wrong. They were right. The movement of the stone was more important than putting the stone erect. And now do you know, now, now do you understand why we mentioned that in regards to our below? Because archaeologists always presume they, they've got this like this little idea about the past they feel that the past should be a certain way and it's not a certain way because the past is a, is a mixture of different ways it's it's a mixture of formulas okay uh hang on a minute i just gotta get my where's my images hang on it's like sisyphus that's that's the mythology of sisyphus he pushed oh, the, the idea of overachievement, yeah? He pushed, the, he pushed a rock up a hill, but he's forever seen pushing this boulder up a hill because it's, it's, it's his effort doing it. He never actually, you know, gets it to the top of the hill, but he keeps pushing it, you know. It's, it's to do with, um, yeah, <clears throat> the effort people put in doing simple things but they're not simple and you know why i've got a big no. smile on my face you know i got a big smile on my face Anne. right we know yeah. in, in the previous lecture where, where we did the line thing yeah. I, I, I mentioned about this point the stonehenge was never completed i mentioned yeah. about avery was never completed i mentioned that in art things are never completed right the point is is that it's actually the effort and the achievement itself and you know what we we as archaeologists we, we want to use, look at that there. It's even on the sign. It says 6,000 year old ritual and funerary monument. Well, yeah. are any of those words correct, ritual or funerary? In fact, mm -hmm. you go on to the notes, which we're going to go on to now, right? You go on to the notes. And we're, 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 we're just going to do this this way, right? Um, let's start off with my, my wonderful notes about Arbolo, right? These are really nice ones. And by the way, the, the Wikipedia stuff, some of it's not exactly correct. So don't go with it. So here we go. Let, let's just let's just try and feed into this. High up in the Derbyshire Peak District on a northward facing slope of Middleton Common is the Henge Earthworks and Circle of Prostrate, weather corroded stones of Arbolo. Bill made a point earlier on. They're so degraded and so don't look right that it might be possible uh, that they were never erect in the first place. That's the point I was trying to make earlier on. I'm not saying that I'm right, but I'm just giving you an idea. A site regarded by Stone Circle Authority, Aubrey Burl, listen to this, this is quite a big ask, but I, I'm, I'm with him on this one, as one of the wonders of megalithic Britain. 
Although sometimes referred to as the Stonehenge of the North, visitors to the last remaining limestone um, circle in Derbyshire may be disappointed that there are no massive upright stones and no trilophons here, but neither are there queues of traffic, hordes of people and no visitor center. In fact, apart from the nearby farm and car park, there are a few modern intrusions. Now, I read that and I actually, I actually made it something else. So we're going to come back to that in a moment, but we're just going to read this sign. So Arbolo Stone Circle and Gib Hill Barrow, there's another monument nearby. Large stone circle with a with a henge. It's not the biggest henge in Britain. It's not the biggest stone circle in Britain, but it's pretty big. Adjacent well-preserved burial mound, which is definitely Bronze Age, not Neolithic Bronze Age. A site of early archaeological investigations, but no recent archaeological excavations, which is a very, very important point. So. If we, hang on a minute, if we move, if we go to this plan here, and I do believe that this is actually from the 1700s, as we have actually meant, already mentioned about 1758, did I say? Um, this, yeah. the, the one thing I say about this site is that it has been mucked around with in the past 200 years, but it's not been mucked around with as much as Avery and Stonehenge. So, it's been drawn and sketched um, for at least the past 250 years. The open aspect of the site, co coupled with its extensive views, particularly to the north, with its minimum of modern clutter, gives the impression of a monument having been left as it is, with visitors free to wander. Now, the impressions that are left with visitors are best summed up as follows. From a certain writer at W. Andrew from, from the early 1900s. He says about the site The very grandeur of its loneliness appeals to memories of the days of old and the race that is gone. I, I agree with all that except for the end bit, the race that is gone. And the reason why this is still with us, the, 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 this site is still. It's still, it's still got a role to play in our minds. It still plays on our minds because we wouldn't be doing it now. It stays playing on my mind because I didn't even know this site existed. So, if we if we think about this and we think we think that well, the one thing is well is we we've got um, it was scheduled as a protected ancient monument in 1882. It's got um, these little markers on the ground, survey markers VR and GR, Victoria and um, and George. Um, and the grass-covered limestone henge earthwork um, is huge with the encircling bank, having an outer diameter of between 85 and 90 metres. Again, there are henge monuments in the country which are close on 500 metres, but this seems to have it all. But maybe we're thinking about this monument um, too harshly in the sense that maybe we're thinking about all the answers that are in the same week. Uh, we, we could say that this site itself seems to play into history over a, over a very, very long period of time. It, it's, got a, it's got a lot to say about it. You know, it, 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 it's, it's got, um, it, it was probably used for the good part of 1,500, 2,000 years. Um, and we very much think if, if we actually look at a plan, let, let's just look, let's just not, do what we did earlier on on Tuesday. Let's just sort of bring straight to an image um, and then we'll come back. There we go. Um, and what it is, um, north is on the right hand side and south is on the left hand side. So the top of the screen um, is west and the south the bottom of the screen is east. It's the way it's orientated. So to give you an idea, talking about directions. Now, th those ditches themselves, the bases of those ditches are between eight and 10 meters. So you know, they're, they're the base, so obviously there's a lot falling in there to sort of um, fill them up. So the bank is discontinuous, as you can see. And basically later on, on the left-hand side of the screen in the south, as I mentioned, they put a Bronze Age monument into this site. Now, one of the things, one of the things that was asked, and one of the things that was commented on earlier on, was not earlier on yesterday, was this site itself. If we think of this site in the modern age, and then we think of the site in the past, 
And then we think that lots of things have happened in the middle. How is it the stones are still there? How is it they're still lying there? Have they always been there like that? What is in fact going on? How, how is the site talking to us? And what we're talking about there is that somebody said, well, in the Roman period, did the Romans respect or disrespect these sites? Mm. And I'm going to give the answer. Yes, they did respect the sites because they're still there. Numpty. Um, and that numpty can come back at me and say, well, yeah, but maybe the Romans destroyed some of the sites. Maybe they did. But they respected some of these sites enough to actually still have them preserved today. Mm. Now, the entrance at the front itself is nine meters wide. So that on the right hand side, which is north, that's nine meters wide. And the one at the south, which is on the left hand side of the screen, that is six meters wide. Now, we're, we're talking about dimensions, um, and none of this stuff is really aligned. It's a bit higgledy piggledy. So, one of the things that we, we sort of read about and think about this site is that was this site thought of by one person at one moment in time? And the answer is no. Nobody ever believed that the site would end up like this. And maybe the people who used this site used it in different ways. Maybe the bank meant something to one group of people. And when they used the platform and put the stones on it, it meant something else to them. So what, what, we, what we think of is that, you know, it would have been a fairly deep ditch at one time. It's obviously been filled in quite a lot. Um, and there's thousands and thousands of tons of material being taken out of these ditches to create the banks. The two entrances do not directly face each other, as you can probably tell. And while the northern entrance is fairly close, the northern entrance is on the right hand side there uh, to the long axis of the stone circle. The southern entrance is offset. So if we sort of look a little bit for more about some of the other images, um, it probably shows it slightly in this that if you look at the image on the right you can slightly see that the entrance is slightly off but it's more acute when you actually look at the error photograph that, that that we've actually already seen now what what we do what we can say about the site is it was archaeologically excavated um by a seasoned professional in 1901 1902 but obviously excavated by other individuals before that time. Now it was excavated by Harold St. George Grey. Now Harold St. George Grey was the same archeologist that excavated on the Somerset Heat uh, villages back at a similar time. Now it said that he only worked in the summer months because it would have been very bleak in the winter. Now, what I'd like to, what I'd like to talk about is just a little bit about his finds. So, what we're going to do, we've got this nice image um, from very early on. I do believe this is from the late 1700s. But what, what, what we then have, we've got that there it is, just to give you an idea, sort of a peak district, um, north, um, east of Stoke and Trent, and sort of um, northwest of Nottingham. Oh, and, and there's Derby. So if we take this, I know this is a plan from 18, 18, 1861. It does look a little bit like, you know, they are aligned, but they're not because this is being done with obviously without aerial photography and stuff. So if we follow this very interestingly, so what he did was excavate um, where the ditches are. So the ditch is actually represented there by the sort of, um, sort of gray type black stuff, right? So, that, that's the ditch that goes around and there's two sort of breaks in it, in the north and the south. So he examined the, the, the north and the south causeway and the ditch on either side. Now, when he was excavating, um, and when he was excavating, he found pieces of red deer antler, um, oxen teeth, he discovered flint and chert flakes and even a pair of arrowheads. So, so he found some evidence in these ditches that sort of give it a Neolithic date. And obviously it's being, it's being used later as well. 
so both of these arrowheads were found in the terminal of the ditch to the east of the northern entrance. So the right-hand side of that ditch and the northern entrance, that's where he found the arrowheads. One was a leaf-shaped um, specimen, typically Neolithic. And another one was found lying at the bottom of the ditch, which is rather interesting. Curiously, also in the same section, he discovered that he discovered evidence that showed evidence of fires at the bottom of these ditches. That could only tell us one thing. What we do know in this period is that people are having fires at the bottom of ditches um, as in a way to sort of welcome the construction of the, um, the site. This is not unusual because what we see um, in regards to the medieval period, we see a lot of cats buried in walls, hopefully already dead cats in walls. And what we also see is in medieval mines, we also also see dead animals in medieval mines. Um, um, when we look at houses from um, civilizations in Central America, what we do find is human remains buried in the middle of houses, um, relatives who have just passed on. This is basically um, this is basically an offering to the construction of the site. And am I saying ritual or ceremony? You can make of it as you will. So Gray also cut through um, the bank on either side of the northern entrance. Now, what he found. On the western side, so on the left-hand side, the bank on the left-hand side of the north, he found it was constructed of mixed loose limestone, bits of dirt, clay and earth. Whereas the one on the left-hand side, the eastern bank, that was constructed of limestone blocks. Now, there's something interesting about this, and I'm just going to say what Gray said, nothing more, nothing less. Gray said... These were different, constru different constructed methods. Um, it may have been constructed by two separate groups of people, perhaps from different communities with different building techniques, or do they suggest the two sections were not built at the same time? That's really, really interesting. If you take that in normal archaeological circles, so say, for example, somebody said, oh, we over there, they built a wall with with um, clay. They, they built the wall with clay uh, and they put a bit of straw into it. And then over there, you've got a wall made of brick. Okay. And then over there, you've got a wall made of stone. It wouldn't be, it would, you might not be wrong in thinking that the one with clay was made before uh, the one with stone and the one with stone was constructed before the one with brick. Right. The point is, is that doesn't that have a make the site have a different appeal? Thinking that on one side they had the ditch and a bank, on the other side they didn't. How would that how would that site look? Very very different. Now what I'd like to do is go to another image. Obviously we've got the stones and there's clear evidence that some have actually been moved since. Back to this one, looking that there's there's an arrangement of stones in the middle. And there's these stones there creating this circle. Um, whilst, whilst we're doing that, folks, I'm going to grab another little bit of a drink because I'm feeling a bit dry. Um, anyone wants to say anything at this stage? Hmm. Bendy, oh, you're, quiet, you're a quiet bunch, aren't you? Oh, go on, and Say something sensible because you did last week. I'm not going to say it, but it's a mystery. <laughs> It's a mystery. And, and, and you've just spouted a word out. Why is it a mystery? Why oh. why should it be a mystery? Why is it a mystery? Tell me why you think it's a mystery. Um no, I, I oh no, it's, it's not fair. No, it is fair. Tell me why you think it's a mystery. Go on. Well, it looks very feminine, you know, it looks very sort of, you know, we've been through this before, haven't we? You know, like uh, female. Um, uh, sort of genitalia. All right. Um, and or ovary, or you know, I don't know. It's just egg shaped. Egg shaped. We mentioned egg shaped. Egg shaped. Yeah, egg shaped. Um, uh, yeah. Actually, 
actually, actually, Anne, actually, Anne, don't say any more because I'm going to say something. Um, right. What you've just said is something that wasn't mentioned on Tuesday, but something that could be in the literature, right? That's a really, really good point. What you've done, you've added something to this lecture, which is very, very good. And that's very interesting because one thing that we haven't, I'm going to take what you've just said in another way, right? What we haven't done is talk, we haven't said, was it gangs of men building this? Was it gangs of women building this? Was it a community building this? The answer is it was clearly a community building this. Uh, forget about this male and female nonsense, right? Um, yeah. Not what you said, but no. the, the male and female nonsense, i.e. I, that men did all the work in the past or women did all the work in the past. So whoever's creating this is creating it in an image, right? It's a portrait of what they see within their lives. Yeah. So what you said is very, very useful. Yeah. The reason why that, um, so I'm not dismissing what you said at all. Um, the one thing that you could say is that now this is a time of community. People are now living in communities. And before that, in the, near, in the uh, Mesolithic period, people were sort of, it was a family type thing, right? because there were small groups it was only big enough sort of family groups and then you've got families going into community groups at the end of the mesolithic period into the neolithic period and then somewhere somewhere after this you've got the you've got the, the construction of long barrows you've mm -hmm. got the construction of very very big stone circle sites that are even bigger than this or stone circle sites that, that stay on their own Things get big and then they get very, very small. Yeah. So the plateau itself that the circle is actually on is, is roughly 50 metres in length. So obviously we said 90 metres in length of everything in, but 50 metres in length. Mm. Um, and interesting enough, it's 45 metres across. It doesn't look it, but it's more or less circular, but it's oh. egg-shaped. Now, yeah, the limestone blocks, the carboniferous limestone blocks, some are complete, some are broken. Well, in several cases, just the stumps of former stone jutting out above the turf line remain. A very interesting stuff. Who, why, where for all and what's going on. Mm. Now, we, we will go on to say that it's believed that these stones may have actually been quarried from somewhere else. I believe that being actually quarried from the ditch, it does make a little bit more sense. You might think that these stones were never placed upright because they're quite friable. Um, and you, you, you might think that there is more to this mystery than meets the eye. When you, when you use the word mystery, mm. the problem is it's, and might like, stand there, Stand there um, 4,000 years ago, right? Mm. Stand there 5,000 years ago. Stand there 5,500 years ago. 5,500, 5,000, 500 years. Um, um, 5, 000, um, back to 5,000, 4,000, 4, that's 1,000 years. So stand there 4,000 years. Wouldn't it be a mystery for uh, 1,500 years on? Remember, when it was the stuff was going on there, and actually, if we want to add another 500 years on, that the first stuff that was being done there was 6,000 years ago. That's 2,000 years before 4,000, right? Wouldn't yeah. you think that people had the same questions? Um, what is this? Wouldn't they come up with the same things in their heads? It's a mystery. In other words, actually, every generation, well, not when I say every generation, that's not fair, you know, every few generations, they're going to forget what the hell's going on. So, in other words, what we're saying, there's even talk that the ditch, that ditch and bank has got no relation to the stones at all. And that the platform's got no relation to the stones either. And that the stones, are, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's just what we've got to do. We've got to, we've got to try and think what's outside the box. For example, um, you've got a Tesco's next door to a Christian church and a Christian church next door to a, um, a creche. None of, them have, none of them are related at all. They do three different jobs. Right, but they happen to be in a row of houses. What does that say? So we 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 look at this and, and we think some of the stones are roughly believed to be up to 10 tons in weight. 
Now, these are the, the stones around the outside. You know, we, we've roughly given you an idea um, of their heights. You know, we, 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 we've basically said that some of the stones are, are maybe one and a half meters, um, two meters, three meters or whatever. But the ones in the middle, they're four meters. They're massive. They're part of another monument all together. Mm. Now, what we need to do, we need to look at uh, an image of a stone. Right. It's an image that I said we're not looking at that, but we are now. And there. Uh, uh, um, right. Bill, is that natural or man made? Oh, is he gone? I think he's gone. Yeah. Oh, oh bugger. Um, who am I going to ask? Um, uh, ask um, Jeff. God. 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 Natural. Nat natural or man-made goth? Natural. It is natural. Yes. And the thing is, this, this is the thing, right? You know, um, you, uh, for years, I've been given images of different things up in the Brecon Beacons, right? Oh, um, yeah. And I, I don't know if you ever saw that image, Anne. There, there's somebody somebody coming with an image of a stone, and there was a there was a like a um, an incision down it, and there's these little lines off. And they said, "Oh, this is different. This is definitely Ogham," mm. and, I, and we turned out to be natural, right? Yeah. Um, and this is the thing. This is a lot of erosion, but they're even saying that this is actually too much erosion mm. for four and a half, five thousand years. The level of erosion on some of the stones has been suggested to be far greater than would be expected to have occurred in one locality, leading to the belief that the stones were not cut fresh from the ditch of the Henge, but were instead hacked out of an existing nearby limestone pavement. Now, limestone pavement, so you get lots of these limestone pavements up in Derbyshire, and you've got lots of cup and ring marks on them, right? So basically, it's an exposed lot of stone. But the problem is they don't know where this limestone pavement was. And I'm starting to think, hang on a minute, right? If they were able to find the limestone pavement because it was exposed, why is that limestone pavement exposed today? Yeah, you, you ask those different questions. The builders of the circle may have chosen this weather-worn rock deliberately, as unlike some, some other circles, like the Nine Maidens, which is not too far away, where the smoother, smoother faces of the stones are placed facing inwards uh, are below some of the stones of their eroded surfaces facing into the circle. Strange. Mm. Or when you think yes, about it, because yeah. they're not standing, how do they know that? How do they know that? That's the point. How do they know that? It's just the way they're lying. And the other thing as well is, have they properly examined these stones? While many of the stones lay flat to the ground, others are at a slight oblique angle. And one stone to the west of the circle is clearly leaning. Well, they some say, as we said earlier on, that it may have been upright at one stage. Now, what what I what I um what I did on what I did yesterday, and I've made the same mistake today. Um, I need to go off the screen a second, and I need to get I need to get a plan up. Uh, because it, it'll help us understand what I'm about to talk about. <coughs> so let's just <coughs> sneeze, and I've got to type something into the screen. Right. Um, I, I forgot to put this in. I do apologise. So um, It's like a keyhole. But it's natural. A natural keyhole yeah. holds hell. Um, so if we, if we type in this, and hopefully I'll be able to get it straight away. Right, if my notes tell me, um, uh, I think we might get that plan anyway. Ah, uh, below, and it's stone, stone circle, and we should get images all, um, and hopefully we'll get, it's an English Heritage Protected site anyway. So if we go, not that one, not that one, don't do the Wikipedia thing, I wouldn't, not on this site. I did spot some mistakes. Um, there, and if we go, this plan is beautiful, it's lovely. That there's a lot of draftsmanship in that, right? It really is. I like that one. 
Um, and there you can see that barrow, that's Bronze Age. And the barrow is actually built sort of out of the earth um, that had already existed. Right, so what I'm going to try and do is, is, is read this and then try and alter this at the same time. The archaeologist John Barnett from the Peak District Archaeological Society produced this plan um, of where each stone would have been placed if indeed they all originally stood upright. So all those little, little red dots show you where the stones may have actually been standing, if they ever were standing. This is the point. The stone bases are shown with a red dot, and the red dashed line is my interpretation of the fallen stones um, from grey. So, so basically, um, I, I think I think what we're talking about is there's been a little bit of movement in, in these stones since the 1900s. This would suggest that the stones were laid out in a in a flattened oval or egg-shaped formation with its apex towards the northwest, so towards the top of the screen, um, towards the northwest and base towards the southeast. Uh, and the when you think about it, the, the the platform is the measurement that we had earlier on. So from the from the furthest south stone to the furthest north stone is 42 meters and 37 meters across the same. It is immediately clear from the plan that the long axis proposed by the red by the red lines on there, by the, by the red line on there um, does not match the alignment of the hinge entrances. In other words, when you look when you see that the, the it doesn't align up with the entrances. You see that there where the line goes across. So, and the other thing as well is 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 that the green line has another significance. Right, Barnack goes on to propose that when seen from the center of the circle, the intersection of the red and green arrows, uh, the midsummer sun would have set above the stone that lies to the right of the axis line, one of a pair that framed the northwest <clears throat> entrance to the top Carl, of the Carl, screen. Carl, can, can, can I make a point here? Oh, you're still there? I, of course I'm still here, yeah. And said you were done. I've been wasting away. I had to go for my supper, didn't I? Yeah. Um, the fact that the north-south um, uh, orientation doesn't match the entrances and exit, okay, could mean that over many thousands of years, magnetic north actually moves. So originally, it probably was. 5,000 yeah. years ago, 6,000 years ago, magnetic north could be just a little bit to the right of the, the south one. So it could be in a line. Keep that in mind. Mm. Actually, actually, you, you've actually added to the, the plethora of information, because if you think of that, if the ditch and the bank were created a thousand years before the stones were erected and there was a different alignment. Can you see what you've just said? Yes, um, in, indeed. Yes, of course. So in other words, the site, the site is designed in two different periods with the ditch and bank and the stone circle with different orientations in mind. So you've probably just answered that question. That's quite possible, yeah. Um, so anyway, but, um, as, as we were talking about the sort of this, the mid-winter sunrise occurring very close to the opposite end of the axis, right? So we're talking about the, um, the, the green line again. The mid-summer sunrise and mid-winter sunrise would have been close to it but not quite along the green axis line. But obviously you're right. Things have changed over time. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a little bit of a squiz on this plan, right? We'll just have a, 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 a li little bit of a, a little bit of a look, see at this plan, right? So I, I, as I say, I like this plan. Um, this is made by Barnett not too many years ago. So what we got, we got, we got this. Um, there's, there's the one leaning stone, the little black one on the left there. Slightly leaning. Uh, we don't really know. It may actually be some soil subsidence. Obviously, um, they're saying that with the red dots, that's where the stones were originally aligned, and they do believe there are missing stones. Um, where are the missing? Yeah, there's a couple of blue blue things there. There's one on the left, one on the right. But do you know, Bill, when you when you've got one exactly on the left and one on the right, maybe there were no missing stones in the first place. We're presuming. Um, 
and obviously we've got the burial at the cove and that's what we're going to look at next the cove that's what we're going to do let, let, let's let's have a little look at this cove a site known as the cove now we've got something called the cove mm -hmm. at um uh, the ring of um um castle rig castle rig and henry's come back in why is henry always coming in and going out? let's bring henry back in and you should have brought henry back in oh sorry sorry hang on bring him in Henry. Yeah, he's how'd on. Bring, he's on. How'd you bring him in? Well, hang on, I've just done it for you, you silly mare. Oh. <laughs> uh, but by, 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 by the way, by the way, um, Roger said he misses you, Anne. Oh, I miss him too. Where is he? Well, he, he, but, but because Bill upset him, right, he's, he's refusing to turn up to these classes. All oh, right. <laughs> something, something about a mobile phone. Oh, um, and I had to I had to apologise on 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 Peter's behalf for touching uh, Pat on the leg that time on the minibus. <laughs> All sorts of things go on these things. Oh, and mm. Anne, right? Anne, and do you know what happened? We had the new guy joining us yesterday, right? And oh. Pete started to go on about the blow up rubber doll incident. Oh, and guess what? This guy runs a sex shop. Oh. So he said he's going to get us another one. Is he from yeah. Kent, Vic? Oh, yeah, I think he is. Have you been there, Ron? Well, there's a sex shop. That's the only place there was a sex shop. <laughs> oh, and my, stop. And my could, friend actually could go there, couldn't it? <laughs> there's a flat up uh, above it. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know, Anne? I know a friend of a friend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and you know that time, you know the time about the, you know that sex doll thing with the yes, other. Yes, I was there. Yeah, but the thing is, the thing is, right? Nobody ever mentioned the sex shop in Aberkenfig. No. I've passed it many times. Yeah, you oh. passed it, but you don't go in, do you? I've never oh, we been got... in, no. <laughs> well, because oh. you wouldn't know what you were looking for. <laughs> you go <laughs> stop. Anyway, where did you get your blow up stop. doll from? <laughs> stop, stop. The cove. The, the cove, more or less in the centre. So you've got the slender long stone there, if that was once standing. And you've got the big fat squat, the big fat stone on the right there. It's now, male the, and female. Now, yes interesting so um that that is mentioned that there, there, there may have been an avenue associated with this site as well but that that's probably in another lecture but um the, that one stone above is 4.3 meters in length and the maximum length of the one at uh, the other one is 4.2 meters and it's very likely these may have been up um, 10 12 13 stone in weight big 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 lots of weight. Mm. They appear to have fallen outwards. They appear to have fallen outwards. Mm. Three broken stumps barely poke out above the grass. So, you know, you've got stumps of stone sticking out. You know, now, that's you know, really, yeah. That, hang, hang on a minute, Anne, that's really interesting. Yeah. If there's stumps of stones sticking out, right, that means that some stones are standing at the site. So why aren't the other stones standing at the site? These ones may have been standing. That's a really interesting point there. Very interesting. Well, don't forget, anyway. it's also very close to the very important uh, village that was like where the plague came from. You know, that was really important in, uh, you know, from the... Well, when was the Great Plague? It was it well, the, the Great the Great Plague? Um, it hit Bristol in um, 1348, and it hit Cardiff by 1349. Well, I don't know when it hit Derbyshire. Southampton, 1347. <laughs> no, it started off in Derbyshire, but that was the bubonic plague. Yeah, that right. was it. That was in the 1600s, love. Right. So, um, so what I'm saying is, you know, the church was very important. And yeah. I think it might have subdued a lot of this paganism. Ah, associated with the stone. Ah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. Sorry. Well, there, that, there's that, funny that... lot out in the country. Yeah, can you, can you remember John who used to come along to our classes? <laughs> Ooh. John. 
You remember John? John, John Stevenson. Oh, yes. He's oh. the only one who's ever been banned from my classes for being racist. <laughs> oh, dear. And you're like, you've taken me somewhere else. Now, stop it. Now, the cove. The cove. Um, the, these are meant to seem to be very rare in Britain, but we do actually have a cove at A3 as well. Um, mm -hmm. They're basically sort of weird little structures inside a stone arrangement, but we do believe that they're much later. Right, much, much later. And there's one talk that there was a cove at Stanton Drew, that other stone circle site that we've been to, and also Woodhenge as well. So Gray's excavations uncovered the skeleton of an adult male buried not far below the surface on the eastern edge of the cove. So basically the eastern edge is where that cross is. Hmm. Um, the man had been laid on his back, roughly north to south with his head to the south, but his skull had been crushed, probably after burial. And his lower jaw was missing, as were his hands, shin, bones and feet. The skeletal remains undated, but is probably a later date, which you might think that that would be the case. A later, further, a later burial was found further east. Uh, which now this is rather interesting. When we say a burial, listen to what listen to these words. A little further east, Gray found a Gray found a pit that contained a fragment of human arm bone. <coughs> interesting. There's another burial, however, but as the pit showed evidence of previous unrecorded excavation, he believed that any other human remains that had once been interred there had already been moved. Or the evidence of the pit itself was evidence that somebody had been digging there and, a, and the um, arm bone or the leg bone was taken from somewhere else. Now, what we, what we do know um, and what we need to do is go back to the other images, right? And, um, and i got to be honest with you, Bill couldn't be bothered to make us dinner. So, uh, <laughs> mind, mind I, you, I've mind you. I've got a on the go. Mind you, there is one thing that Bill can't even deny. I made Bill a, um, a, a sumptuous a breakfast once. True. It was the finest breakfast that Bill had ever had in his life. It, it was a trucker's delight, yes. It was. Thank you. But leave it there, Bill. That's a compliment enough. Just leave it there, right? <laughs> um, so that monument on the right is 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 Bronze Age. So we're technically really supposed to be doing the Neolithic stuff. We're doing Neolithic Bronze Age. So we're Neolithic. That barrow itself is rather interesting. And why is it interesting? Because in the Bronze Age, um, when this site is, is it disused? Is it whatever? It's obviously not disused properly because it's, if you, they, instead of putting the barrow directly in the middle of this site, they put it on the right. They, they, they put it on the, the um, southeast side. And, and that, to me, is rather interesting. In other words, they respected the site enough and they put the barrow into the bank, which was around the outside. And I think that's absolutely amazing. That was excavated um, by, by Heyman Cock um, in 1782. Now, there's evidence of an avenue, uh, but we're not going to do that today because we don't really have much evidence for it. But... Let's what I want to do is I want to look at um, some of the antiquarian stuff about the site, which is which is which is really intriguing. Uh, and I want to look at some some sort of other key details. So our below is clearly a, a site that represents successive constructional phases, which we will completely agree. Time spans that really overlapped and listen to this. The elaboration of the site reflected the changing meanings, beliefs, and values of those that undertook the remodeling of the site. And I can't disagree with that in any way, one way, shape, or form. The order in which the separate elements were constructed and during which period of prehistory they occurred has always been open to debate. Although, um, although you know, we know it was constructed over a long period of time. Now, look at this site. Here we go. The, the, some say that the henge was built first with the ditch. So the bank and the ditch was built first. Then the platform in the middle with the circle. 
then the cove, then the barrow, and then the avenue. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this that we all that it's always assumed that the henge was built first. I believe that the henge was built first, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Our below conservation plan follows this sequence and gives suggested dates that the earthworks were built at least 5,000 years ago, if not before. And the barrow there finally on the right hand side was clearly made, constructed in the Bronze Age 4,000 years ago. So this thing about henge monuments, recent reappraisals of henge monuments, especially in respect to those which contained additional features such as rings or timber or stone circles like Woodhenge um, and the likes of Stone Stonehenge, has suggested that the henge before circle idea may be incorrect and that in many cases it was the timber or the stone elements which were the primary monuments which were constructed first before the bank and the ditch. don't agree with that. But whether this was done as beliefs changed, and now this this thing is, I would go with this next thing, whatever came first, right, uh, we'll agree with one thing. Um, beliefs changed. Over this period of time, they would have changed over a thousand years, thousand five hundred years ago. The already sacred site, the already site with meaning would have been revised with a reappraisal. And the cove in the middles, a reappraisal of that really, uh, you know, but what we do find, this is key, everything seems to be built and seems to be left. You know what I mean? It's like nobody's mucking around with it. Even in the Bronze Age, they don't fill in the ditch. They just put the, um, the barrow into the bank um, of the existing um, Henge Monument, which I think is absolutely brilliant. As always in archaeology, Archaeology is lies, lies, and more lies. Oh, no, sorry, I'm just quoting from Bill. As always in archaeology, it could be that as, as more evidence comes to light and theories are refined, then ideas about the dates and the sequences of construction at Abelow may be subject to change and probably will. So the last bit now is, I believe, the most intriguing thing about the site completely, right? Now, we did a little bit of this before we did a little bit of this um, before before the break. Right. We and I'm just going to recap on some of this. And then what we're going to do is um, we're going to look at Christians throwing down these stones, which we haven't done. We haven't looked at Hilkington um, and we haven't looked at the work of William Bateman. So let's just crack on with that. Arbolo being first properly documented, even though it was known about before that, as in 1785, when documented, records, plans were made of the site. Um, a reasonable attempt at a plan was made, okay. elevation drawings, which, which us guys, we've already seen. Um, and it's uh, that there. There we go. Beautiful, 1785. Um, and he made an account of the site. He therefore inadvertently kick-started the interest in the site. Our friend Rev Reverend Samuel Pegg turns out to be an analytical thinker as he goes on to support his belief with some astute observations and noting the fragmentary state of some of the stones he suggests. Now, again, I, um, you look at the plan there, it doesn't look as, as higgledy-piggledy as when we look at a more uh, recent, you know, it, it does look it does look a little bit more broken, right? Um, and even there may have been damage to the site since this time. Anyway, back to 1785. Um, he said the pieces lying dispersed at some distance from one another could be owing to nothing else but their falling and breaking in the fall. He goes on to propose several reasons why the stones might have fallen suggesting there might be an original defect in the ground direction um, by not planting the stones deep enough in the ground for example there may have been some kind of wind action or bolsterous wind might prostrate many of them in such an exposed and elevated situation interestingly barnett and burl the writer burl again or aubrey burl we've already mentioned him and barnett writing two centuries later 
and with the accumulation accumulated benefit of archaeological knowledge behind them also come to similar conclusions the stones were placed into sockets or holes that were cut too shallow into the limestone bedrock and were probably most felled by northerly winds howling down from the pennines i can't go with that i just can't i really really can't indeed some of the stones in the northern arc um have fallen inwards in a southerly direction, while almost all of the stones of the southern arc have fallen outwards. But, you know, winds, winds to blow stones down. Well, i got to be honest with you, Bill, right? If that's the case, none of the stones at um, the Ring of Broadgood would be standing end of because the winds in Orkney are quite howling, as we've witnessed. So not going to go with that. Um, so are the winds in West Wales. The sing now... It says about um, the single remaining leaning stone, but it's not really a leaning stone, is it? And, we're, 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 you know, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's slightly, you know, you can't really see it on there either. It's not exactly upright. Um, anyway, our writer says that the zeal of the first Christians inhabiting these parts might cause them to be thrown down as remains and monuments of pagan superstition. Can I just say one thing? Uh, I... I, I know this stone in in at Avebury. I haven't told this story for ages. So here we go, Anne. This is a story you haven't heard for ages. At Avebury, there's a stone that's lying flat. And when they when they lifted the stone, they found the remains of an individual underneath the stone. And this individual seemingly had um, surgical tools with him and a coin dating to the reign of Edward II, who I do believe died in 1327. Therefore, the individual, it looks like, was, was paid a silver <coughs> coin to undermine the, the stone, and the stone fell on him. So, yeah, the, these, these things did happen. We, we've got evidence of this. And even at Stonehenge, people were hiring... Um, uh, a hammer and a chisel from the local blacksmith shop down the road to take chunks out of Stonehenge, even in uh, the 1800s. While not going as far as suggesting their destruction on religious grounds, Barnett believes that some of the stones may indeed have met a violent end. One stone may have evidence of drilling for explosives. Ooh. Fragments of another have ended up in the Henge ditch, while a handful of the other stones were probably carted away for building material. One such weather worn and whole stone stood for a while as a gatepost to uh, the um, to the local farm. Now we're nearly at the end of this today. Well, actually, we're not because there's so much more I would like to look at our below, but um, we're not gonna we're not gonna do it till it's dead what we're going to do we're going to sensibly read this now um and then we're going to call it a day because this is this has been quite a long lecture for some of us and there is an aerial view of the site so um as to when the last stones fell james pilkington writing just a few years after reverend peg also gives an account of being told that a very old man remembers when he was a boy to have seen them standing um, upright upon one end. Presumably, this was William Norman Shaw again. And if the accounts were true, then it would date the last surviving upright um, stones that were still maybe upright in the 1700s. Or were they? Or maybe that's just supposition. However, another author, Stephen Glover, uh, there's a joke here, Stephen Glover. Uh, he liked his hands. Never mind. Writing in 1829 dismisses any such claims and secondary evidence of very little merit. And given the lack of any other document documented eyewitness accounts, he, he may well be right that they were never upright at all. <coughs> Glover also included a plan of the site. Um, said to be copied from an accurate drawing by Samuel Mitchell, who worked alongside William Bateman, father of Thomas Bateman. They, they were well known for their, their diggings, which we will look at when we look at our barrow work next week. It may not be 
particularly accurate, but it does show the long earth uh, work bank or avenue emerging from the south of the Kend um, bank. We haven't got that exact, but what we have, we've got the avenue leading there. You can actually see it. So, you know, we've got this on this aerial view. Uh, and by the way, there's, uh, if you type in R below onto YouTube, there's a company called, um, oh God, they're going to hate me because I did mention it yesterday. Um, cinema, cinematography, um, something or other. And um, anyway, if you type in R below, you'll be able to get the aerial photography. It's really good. They, they, they've done loads of flying above it. It may not be particularly accurate, but it does show the low earth work bank or avenue emerging in the south of the Henge Bank. You can clearly see that in the aerial photograph. It also depicts several stones within the southern uh, entrance as forming a pair of rows. So in other words, you know, rows leading out of this. We don't know they're gone now. Whether this was just a misinterpretation of the existing portal stone, a stone standing outside the monument, within the southern edge as forming a pair of rows, whether this was just a misinterpretation of the existing portal stone, uh, we don't know. This is rather interesting that we've got evidence of an avenue, which we actually see at Avebury with the West Kennet Long, um, with the West Kennet um, Avenue, and also at Stonehenge and other sites. So the site is truly amazing within the landscape. There's so much more to be said about the site. Um, but um, just, to, just to give you a little bit more detail, just, just a few things to skip over the edge, just a few more facts. Arbolo is the only remaining limestone circle in Derbyshire. Is it? I'm not really sure about that. One was said to previously exist, exist within the Bullring Henge at Dove Holes, 10 miles to the north-west. Uh, but these stones were removed in the 1700s for building material. Um, it's in the 1700s, a certain John Ward un uncovered some interesting information in some unpublished records by Samuel Mitchell regarding the account of stones being upright in the 1700s. Now, actually, John Ward is the same guy who's excavated at Tinkinswood Burial Chamber um, in 1914. It's the same guy, John Ward, um, who's looking at the site in the um, early 1900s. So um, th this, this thing, um, this thing about them still standing in the 1700s, I got a much greater account. Yeah, listen to this. June the 1st, 1824, examined, um, um, uh, examined North Northampton, William Northampton of Middleton, age 74, spoke, examined, spoke to, uh, uh, William North and Shore of Middleton, uh, age 74. Um, son, um, son of uh, William North uh, Shaw, uh, mentioned by Peg. He says he has repeatedly heard his father, who died about 20 years ago, at the age of 90, say that he remembered the stones in the circle are below, many of them standing, more erect than they do now. Um, does not think they had undergone much alteration then, but obviously alteration since. So I'm probably going to call it a day there now because that's a, that's a nice bit to end on. Um, you know, there's loads more images out there to look. Um, and, you know, you, you, you just, it, it, it's, it's well worth sort of trawling the internet uh, and to try and see more information about the site. And lots of bits of pottery have been found, mainly from the Bronze Age. Um, one or two bits from the Neolithic period, but maybe from the Bronze Age, and lots of other tools and artefacts. On that note, uh, we're gonna, there it is, yeah. there's where it is if you ever want to go up there. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful um, area. It, it is a beautiful area, and uh, lots of interesting things to um, see. And there's there's a bit of a view. Obviously, it's 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 taken at the time of the year that everything looks flat, and it's certainly not. No. Um, and so obviously we'll just click back on these beautiful images again that aerial view is very helpful is, quarry? is that a quarry down the bottom there on Cobb Gibb Hill 
That, that looks like cool? quarry activity, yeah. That yeah. looks like quarry activity, yeah, it does, it does, it does. It does look quarry activity. I'm not really sure, but it does look quarry activity. Mm -hmm. um, the, again, beautiful aerial views. There's, there's buckets of them on the internet. Well worth a little look. Again, this plan for 1861. Um, another one there. Um, again, showing you where it is in the Peak District. A little bit more of an image of what it looks like within. It, mm -hmm. it, you squint your eyes, you could almost be at Avery with a great ditch, uh, bank around Avery. Again, natural weathering. Mm -hmm. And there I we go. Eight, eight, um, 1785, the markers of survey and showing you the site. There you go. Um, and there's the site, and they're showing a proper witch. Um, there's the lecture of Arbalo. Any questions? I got one, Carl. Um, to actually f find out whether these stones were standing in the 18th century, um, why don't you use science? In other words, turn some of these stones over and use this technique we've discussed in the past of the surface luminescence using isotopes to actually predict oh, God, keep when, going. when sunlight actually the last time sunlight fell on the stone that's been done surely or hasn't it no it hasn't been done oh my god <laughs> oh, oh that's good oh, hang on hang on, hang on a minute Wait, so so basically, basically, actually, my that's been suggested in nothing that I've read. What we're going to do, Bill? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a little bit of a sketch now. Bill, Bill's a billion percent right. Um, th there we go. We've got a little bit of a sketch. So basically, what we've got, Bill is right. We've got the we've got the ground level. Um, the 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 stone at some stage uh, was moved, right? Because they couldn't have been natural natural. Um, within the landscape um, and the stone's been placed there. <coughs> maybe, maybe the earth level has gone up and maybe the earth level has gone down, but the stone is technically not moved um, from the point that it was there when it fell down. So in other words, you lift this stone up and what happens is underneath the stone, it'll give a signature to the last time that, that underneath the so stone was exposed to the sunlight, thermal yeah, yeah. luminescence dating. And that man, give him a kiss on the cheek, Anne, now, because I love that. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, you've already said that it hasn't been, you know, excavated recently. Probably excavated, exactly. You know, and, and you were coming up with this stuff from about, you know, the eight, 1980s, I think, or, you know, it, it was, you know, late on that they yeah. started using this because we were doing all the modern techniques at the that, last sort of lot of classes you did, you know, in, in yes. Pope Baptist. So, yeah, I mean, it's something because a lot of the writing is quite old, isn't it? You know, relatively old so yeah, so, and yeah, the, yeah. The, the, hang on the other thing as well is bill's point right so the the description in 1785 by peg um 1785 um other than that one weird exception they were all lying flat they they uh um mm. recumbent stones so you know they've been lying flat for at least nearly uh 250 years so you know yeah See if they've been laying flat before that as well. Exactly, that's that's what we need, and and it would take one one of the stones to actually give us that, and it would just be a simple matter of lifting up and putting it back down again. You go right to that man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could all go up and try the oil and seaweed. <laughs> oh right, well, yeah, but I I don't think we'd get away with it somehow, but you know. Um, Anyway, right, Bill. Anything else you'd like to say? Because Bill that has got to be one of the best, um, your best contributions in ages. <laughs> and and you could find a stone which may have been there for six thousand years ago, which would indicate oh. that they were actually laid flat originally. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And in, and in, in, in fact, before they muck around with any more stones at um, Stonehenge, they need to really see if they were ever put up there upright in the first place. Right, yeah, yeah they need to use that dating mm -hmm. technique. Yeah, exactly. I completely they, agree with you. 
That's my lot. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Right, anything you'd like to say, Anne? Well, it's certainly a much more interesting site than I thought. And, you know, it's got a lot of attributes that are worth, you know, make it well, that which make it interesting, not not least the ditch and banks, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because you don't always get those. I mean, that the, the stone circles of, of uh, Bronze Age are usually, um, they don't have bank and ditches, I don't think. They're just sort of. <clears throat> yeah, they're much smaller. The sites yeah. of the Bronze Age are much yeah. smaller. There are banks and ditches, but they are much smaller. Right. Yeah. Anything else, Anne? No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you for your lesson. Right. Okay. Who's next? Um, Richard Baby. Um, yeah, I agree with that, with what Bill is saying as well. And I can't believe that if there's, I know any holes that they would have been set in, would have filled in with um, earth and that, you know, and probably sheep wandering about and all this, but surely there'd be stones that we use to pack the standing stone in. And, and that, that would be very easily to detect. Give that man a medal. Yeah, yeah he's right. They're He's not the just holes in the got. ground. There would be packing material. Yeah. Yes. Keep the going. I got here, the guy is sort of saying, you know, that um, there's about 50 stones there and there's one of them is actually stood up. But saying that, the picture that I've got, you can virtually hardly see any sort of stone stood up. If it is uh, stood yeah, up, it's not uh, very it, tall. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's at an angle. It's not standing straight. It's at an angle. But yeah. So. Actually, actually, Richard, your point there was very good. I, yeah, I agree with you on that one. So the other thing is going on about it. This guy is a bit into ley lines and everything. Because he's sort of saying, well, there's 50 stones and there's 50 ley lines connected with it. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we did mention ley lines before. Yeah, we can go with yeah. that. Um, right, so. Who else have we got now? We've got um, Palavou Francais, uh, Henri. Very interesting. There's a, obviously a lot more work to be done there, and I completely agree with Bill's comments entirely. Yeah. Um, I, I've got an off-the-wall one for you. Could it yeah. be a, a, a theatre, i.e. that the surrounding area was the standing area to view the platform? Well, well, can we can we just leave the theatre thing until Goff has, uh, and I will respond to that in a moment. Goff, is that all, is that your lot? Is that your lot today, um, yes. Henry? Yes. Got anything else? No, yeah. that's fine. Okay, we're going to do the theatre thing in a minute. You're going to get my take on that, Goff. Yeah, it's very interesting. Again, a lot of questions to be answered. Yeah. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, thank you for the visit to Arbor Lowe. Oh, my, my pleasure. I, I I needed to bring you to a site that I'd never heard of three three weeks ago. I needed to share that with you. I had to, you know, I had to. Um, so it was as new to me, more or less, to you guys. So I, I wanted to do that. Um, right. This. Thank you for that, Goff. I, I really appreciate that, Henry. You're. Have you got anything else to say, Goff? No. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, now. Um, in my in my other class before this, the six o'clock one, I, I I use the word theatre and I use the word acting and I use the word stage a lot. Um, you know, if you looked at a type of site like this in the Roman period, you'd say it's definitely a theatre, right? Um, and there's no there's no reason why things couldn't have been going on on that site and people sitting on the bank and looking in. That would make perfect sense. However. That may be one interpretation, because as we're saying that this site has different interpretations over time. And to be honest with you, uh, one thing that was suggested in some of the other reading, I can't remember, and I, I'm not going to go through it now, but it did say that um, that cove in the middle, one of the stones was a, a little bit tall and the other stone was a little bit tall. Right. And if people were looking in sort of from the entrance area, they wouldn't be able to see what's going on, but they'd be able to see it from the bank. Right. And the point is, is that this idea of the bank ancestors being with your ancestors, um, trying to communicate, 
Uh, voices, discussion, theatre. I like that idea very much. I like it, lots of things that we said today, to be honest with you. That's my response, uh, Henry. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Where are you, Henry? It's all you see is a blank wall. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> you need more light in that room, I think. Can't you uh, light a candle or something? Uh, no, we've run out of candles. <laughs> <laughs> Jake, you want a four candle? A uh, four candle. Four candles. <laughs> four candles, candles for forks. <laughs> no, four candles. Okay. Right, no yeah, right so what we're going to do is, as Bill, Richard, Henry, and Goff, or me, got anything else we'd like to say this week before we finish? No. No, no thank you. No, thank you, thank Carl. You. It's, it's it's been my absolute pleasure, Bill, Henry, Goff, and Anne, and Richard, and hopefully I will see you next Tuesday, uh, okay. next Wednesday, next right, next Wednesday, Wednesday at six o'clock, yeah. and you other guys at quarter past seven, or anyone who wants to join us on Tuesday, seven thirty. Okay, thank okay. you. Thanks, Carl. Cheers, Cheers, everyone. Bye. Bye. My pleasure. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Take care. You have a good one. Bye. Yeah, Bye. Tell you waking down. Yeah, exactly. Night, night, guys. Bye. Night, night, Anne. Night, night, Henry. Night, night. Night, night. Uh, that was a very long one today. I feel it. It wasn't as long as yesterday, but that was a very, very felt long. Right, but we did it. We we managed to get through it. Not as much as we got through yesterday. Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, but I think we 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 developed some of the things we had yesterday. Some of those things, the thermoluminescence, to where it just see if the stones never been moved. Oh, I love it. That was again. Yeah, why did we actually do more of this? I I, I don't know. Right, what a great technique. We should do use that more. Before we lift stones from a site, maybe we should be doing more of the thermoluminescence dating, looking, dating. Archaeology could be so much more than just digging muddy holes in the field and actually finding out more. Anyway, this is Carl James Blackford. I'm, I'm going to call it a day now. Um, again, where was I? I was in the chat box. There's nothing in the chat box as, as usual. So anyway, don't forget to like, subscribe, press the join button, the blue button. Thank you very much. Good night. Dioch and varachi. Gwalachi. Eto. Hedwyll. Dioch.